Starting on my far left, um, I want to introduce uh, the panelists here. First, we have Amy Dumato, who is the Director General of FedNor. Uh, Amy started his career with the federal government in 1973, having worked for Revenue Canada and in Indian and Northern Affairs. Uh, in 1978, he transferred to the province of Ontario to work with the Ministry of Northern Affairs. Uh, Amy served as the Executive Director of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund for the, about eight years, responsible for overseeing significant development corporation, the thus significant development corporation, which administers numerous funding programs designed to foster job creation and strengthen communities across the North, as many of you know. Um, in 2010, Amy was appointed the Director of General of FedNor, the Federal Economic Development Initiative for Northern Ontario. Uh, to his middle, we, oh, sorry, to his right, with Tom Rand, I've already introduced, so I won't do that. Uh, and on my close left here, we have Alex Henderson, who's the uh, General Manager, Underground Mining Technology Base Metals at Valet, where he has been since 2005, uh, initially joining as the Manager of Business Analysis and Mining Technical Services. Uh, prior to Valet, he was a manager in the corporate office for De Beers Canada, and he has over 30 years in the mining industry ranging from roles as an actual miner to engineering to mine manager and even project manager for starting a new mine. So the intent of this panel is to have very different perspectives. Again, at the onset, governmental perspective, entrepreneurial perspective, and big corporate perspective as it pertains to innovation. So, gentlemen, I'm going to kick off here with a quick question and one that plays to the theme of Tom's presentation. Uh, there have been a handful of reports. Most recently, the Ontario Chambers of Commerce released a report um, the BAMP Forum released a report citing one of the core problems that Canada faces is, a, is, is the cultural elements associated with innovation and entrepreneurship. And it's a national problem included potentially in the greater Sudbury area as well. What do we need to do to inspire would-be or existing entrepreneurs uh, to really think about taking that leap of faith and giving it a go? And I'll start with you, Alex. Any thoughts from the valet perspective? It's an interesting uh, question or perspective. I guess to a certain degree it covers a very broad area. So innovation and, and in regards to innovation we, always, we often look at the fact that there needs to be a need, there needs to be an idea, but ultimately there needs to be um, um, commercialization in such a way that it improves the business. So there's three key components to an innovation. <coughs> Quite often the person who creates the idea isn't necessarily the best entrepreneur to sell the idea and, and quite often it's two very different skill sets that are required in order to advance those things. Um, you know, I don't know, I, I would say that, you know, so do, do Canadians or through our educational or our upbringing or these sorts of things that we're very conservative, that we don't like to take risks, we don't, a lot of us aren't, you know, would be viewed as entrepreneurial. I mean, I think in all of us there is some entrepreneurial components. Um, as an engineer, I know as an engineer quite often we're not viewed as being creative. You know, we stick to very uh, scientific ways of doing things. Um, but at the same time, put it in the right environment with somebody who can uh, instill a, a, a situation where you think creatively, I think we all have a certain component of that sort of thing. Um, so I think that in, in a lot of the cases, you know, we just don't do a good job of bringing it out and, and we don't establish the right mixes of, you know, the idea, the people that are good at creating ideas and the good people that can take that to market and, and right. commercialize it. Amy, if I were to ask you from uh, where you sit as Director General of FedNor and the individuals that you meet in the community, how do you see this, this culture of risk-taking, innovation, entrepreneurial spirit? What are your perspectives? Well, I, I guess on the entrepreneurial uh, part first, first thing I do is, is take the gene from this gentleman and inject <laughs> it into every young kid that you can put your hands on. Because I think that's a fundamental problem that we have. And, and I wouldn't say probably just in Northern Ontario, but, but certainly I, from, from an Ontario perspective I can speak on, uh, is we don't do a good job at teaching entrepreneurship to be an entrepreneur. We, we, we are still, uh, you know, in our educational institutions, focused on career development. And yet, you look at our economies and what's happened. At one point in time in, in this Sudbury Basin, there were how many thousands and thousands of people that worked for then Inco and Falconbridge? And I, I come, I'm an Inco brat. I come from Inco and I could have had a career uh, with Inco because my father and his brother and my brother 
uh, work for the company, and so I was guaranteed that, that opportunity. Same thing with governments and other large institutions. Well, the sad reality, or the reality, is that we're seeing corporations constrict, we're seeing governments running out of money, running deficits, constricting, and so when, when you're in, at, at a college level and you're thinking about, never mind college, if you're in a high school level thinking, you know, what should I be? You know, when I grow up, what do I want to be? We, we should be at that level, if not even before then, starting to talk about entrepreneurship uh, and giving that an opportunity to grow. It's too late if we're talking about entrepreneurship at college and at the university level and saying, okay, what are we going to do now and, uh, and start injecting money and, and thinking that, you know, these folks are going to come out of the woodwork and be tomorrow's leaders with respect to tomorrow's economy. Right. Tom, building on that, how do we, assuming to be true, and we heard some insight here, how do you drive a culture of innovation, a culture of entrepreneurship in Canada? What do we need to do, either the greater Sudbury area more specifically, or Canada more broadly? What would you do if you said one idea to really invigorate this community to say, let's go for it, knowing that this is how we're going to create sustainable job and wealth creation for this country? Uh, it's difficult. I, mean, I think these gentlemen have covered off some of the big issues. One of them is, is teams, right? They, we need to find ways for people to collaborate and so on. So I, I would agree with them. They've said, the only thing I would add, I think, is to sort of be able to uh, trumpet our success stories a little, a little better, to, be, to, to point to our success stories as not something... Again, that's why I talked about motivation. It's not always just being greedy for a company. Like people build companies for all kinds of reasons. And to be more proud of the successes that we have and point to them as examples of good, interesting pieces of the social fabric. And that we shouldn't be scared of failures. If someone, I, you know, if someone fails, that's fine. It's a badge of honor in Silicon Valley if you, if you fail. You have to explain why, but it's a badge <laughs> of honor. I mean, you know, because you've given it a shot. And I think we, we don't, we don't, we, we're scared of failure here. We're ashamed of it. And we don't trumpet our successes enough. And, and you know, let's. Good. Uh, any questions from the audience? No? I can continue? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, we have one here. If you could stand up and just introduce yourself, please. And where, and where you're from, or who you're with. Yeah. I want to ask a question about uh, the Silicon Valley and the development of the Silicon Developing entrepreneurship in our culture. Um, I guess the social scientists tell us that entrepreneurship, or ideas happen all over the place, and good ideas. What happens better in cultures that, places that promote entrepreneurship is squelching isn't there. The, uh, the, the mechanisms that squelch ideas or, or uh, impede development of ideas are just not as strong and deliberately so. So I'm, I wanted to ask, for organizations like Mars or like NSERC or stuff like that, how are you guys evaluated? Are you evaluated in terms of the number of businesses you set up that are successful or are you evaluated on the basis of what good risks you've taken? There, there's a difference yeah. there in terms of squelching. Yeah, well, Mars itself is evaluated ultimately on one metric, which is how many jobs are created by the companies that we help. I mean, that, that's sort of the, the ultimate metric. We have lots of stuff in the middle, how much capital is raised by our companies, how many patents they file, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's, it's job creation. Yeah. Any other uh, questions from the audience? Okay, one of the other challenges, and in my uh, short tenure here, uh, something I've discovered, and we hear this from many innovators, especially at the entrepreneurial stage, is when starting out in their business, one of the big challenges they have is getting their first customer, be it a beta, non-paying reference customer, but getting that first customer in Canada because this nascent entrepreneurial endeavor has no brand. They haven't established credibility and, and sustainability as an operating business. So Alex, if I start with you, how does Valet look at early stage entrepreneurial ventures in the greater Sudbury community that are looking for that reference customer when they approach these big corporates to say, I just need your stamp of approval. Once I get that, I can go global. But if I don't get it in my own backyard first, no one's going to take me seriously. So what is the, 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 the role that corporates could play in giving these early stage companies a reference customer? So I think we've got a prime example of that sort of thing in, in um, the work that we're currently doing on the Railvare. Uh, so it's a, a local uh, company <clears throat> that has uh, developed new, te new transportation technology. And they're... Um, a very junior company, okay. The um, uh, to a certain degree, Valley as a large company 
takes a look at technology or um, any feasibility study that we would do in terms of the application of technology to improve the business. Feasibility studies mean that they're bankable documents with proven technology. And, and so quite often the startup technology or the new ideas aren't really at a point where they're proven. And, and so in this case, uh, I went to Valet or, or did a presentation to Brazil kind of saying to, to take this uh, uh, technology, build a demonstration plant such that we then could demonstrate it to the point where it would be uh, considered feasible or proven uh, would cost $50 million. Okay. <clears throat> Lots of debate in terms of whether we should buy out the IP, whether we should buy out the company because it's junior, or whether we should let that foster and grow you know, for the mining industry as a whole. And, uh, and uh, so far the project is going extremely well. And, uh, and as well, you know, it was, it was extremely interesting seeing this presentation because three years ago I put together a theme for this work that we're doing. And it's a corny saying, but it's about safe, lean, green mining machine. And, and to a certain degree, the, the rail bear is a key enabler to that in terms of allowing us to become much greener. And uh, so it's, it's a, it, uh, you know, I, I really appreciated the, the conversation or the presentation and the importance of the, uh, the impacts that the mining industry has on, on the environment and ultimately, you know, the work that we're doing with this rail bear and the benefits ultimately that we'll see from a, from a green perspective in terms of the, the ultimate improvements. Amy, I'm curious to get your perspectives. Nascent entrepreneurial endeavors, looking to get that initial traction to demonstrate that our own country endorses and buys into their technology proves problematic. You know, what do you see from your perspective? I think government comes at it from, from two perspectives. Uh, probably more recently, where government is now realizing it is one of the biggest purchasers of product and services across Canada, federal government. And, and so whether that be uh, in, in shipbuilding or marine uh, or, or the war machinery. Um, we now have a policy in Canada that says those companies that, that win those kinds of multi-million dollar, billion dollar contracts have got to now start giving back to the economy in the regions across all of Canada. Uh, and so it allows us then to say to nascent entrepreneurs, new developers, innovators, You've got an opportunity here to uh, gain benefit from what the federal government's doing. We've got another example out in the hallway here of uh, a colleague of mine, I think it's a small business um, uh, department, where they've uh, recently launched a program to in fact assist new entrepreneurs that they'll buy their first innovative idea or product in order to be that first, uh, that first buyer of the product, to prove it out and then what we do is we take it they take it and say, okay, federal government, the rest of you, all of us, how could you use it, you know, and, and try to implement that way. The other significant activity that the federal and, and probably most provincial governments do is supporting the entrepreneurial spirit in terms of actually developing businesses. But at, at one time we used to just throw money at, you know, you got an idea, here's some money, good luck to you. And now we're saying, well, wait a minute, we need to now start linking you to make you, hopefully, and you know, and, and you should not worry about failure, but in order to try to mitigate some of the failure, is start linking you with researchers, with innovative kinds of, of companies, with innovation uh, opportunities, with the colleges and universities that may have experience and offer advice to you, whether it be in terms of marketing your product or before you, you know, all the pre-commercialization uh, points that you gotta go through before you hit the market on day one. And that's where we're starting to do a better job. We've got a long way to go. Uh, you know, you think of Northern Ontario, we've got six colleges uh, and four universities scattered across 90% of the land mass of the province of Ontario, serving 700,000 plus people. So we're scattered all over the place. Right. So it's not easy for us to make the same kinds of linkages as you would if you're Mars in Toronto and you look around and within a one mile circle, uh, you know, all of the economic activity that you have at your disposal. So it, it offers us some unique opportunities Absolutely. and initiatives that, you know, from a government's perspective, hopefully, knock on wood, we continue to invest in, yeah. whether it be a NORCAD of the world or the other innovation centers that we've helped create across Northern Ontario. That's fantastic. 
That's great news. Tom, from your perspective, your, 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 maybe you could speak to your two or three startups that you've had. Did you get your first customers in Canada? How did you do that? And what would be your insights for here? Again, what would be your existing entrepreneurs that are driving an innovation, overcoming that barrier? Yeah, I'd actually be a contrarian on this one just for fun. I, I would argue, first of all, <laughs> that we do have a decent set of programs to help uh, Canadian corporations engage as the first customer. We have Fednor, we have FDTC, we have IDF. They are there, and we have uh, Norcat and Mars to help people figure out how to negotiate that stuff. So I would argue there are legitimate efforts being made to help Canadian companies be the first customer. And second of all, I would also argue, who cares? If you have something good, uh, go and find somebody who wants it. And if it's not in Canada, go to where that person is. You've still got to convince the person in Canada that they want to be the flagship customer. They're not going to do that out of the goodness of their heart. They're going to do that because you're solving a problem for them. You maybe have some capital from Fednor that helps you. But you have to solve their problem. So if you're solving their problem, you can solve the problem in Austria or anywhere. So I would argue it doesn't have to be here. Good. Questions? Anyone? Oh, we have one here. Hi. I'm uh, an entrepreneur, and I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And I live in the greater city of Sudbury, and I feel like I live in a bubble here <laughs> a bit. Sorry, I live in a what? As an entrepreneur, though, but I'm oh, curious because we're talking about the private sector and, and you know, the, um, in terms of the profit. And what about social entrepreneurs? What about social enterprise? Because there doesn't seem to be a lot of support around that concept here in the city. And some of those, uh, you know, bringing platforms like the TEDx environment here or new platforms like that around creativity or divergent thinking is a really hard sell when we're talking about planting seeds for entrepreneurial behavior. So I'm, that's just wide open uh, to any of our panelists. So social entrepreneurship, the role that it plays. And you know, you mentioned TED. You know, uh, Tom, you're a TED speaker. Maybe yeah, you can comment I think on actually that. that's actually an excellent question. I, and I meant to address social entrepreneurship at the end. I knew I was missing a point. Um, I actually didn't know what social entrepreneurship was at one point. I didn't get it. I thought entrepreneurship was about making companies. And I did a the fellowship called Action Canada. It's a federal leadership thing. Um, and I met a lot of people there who are entrepreneurs, but they described themselves as social entrepreneurs. And I said, I, I, I don't even know what that is. And he said, well, social a social entrepreneur is someone, just like you take, you know, you find the resources around you and you creatively leverage those resources to solve some problem. You're just doing it for some social good rather than making a, a gizmo. And I, 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 that made me understand what he was talking about. And I think what's beginning to be understood is the role that social entrepreneurship can play. And I think there's a lot of young people, and we see this at Mars all the time. And Don, you, you were there when SIG was founded. There's an enormous number of people who <laughs> don't really feel like just having a job that makes gizmos. And there's, they're, coming into, they're coming into the social innovation generation at Mars and trying to figure out ways to scale what they do. And I think it's an untapped force. I think it's underappreciated and untapped. And I think if we found resources and, again, formalized it, told some stories about it, had some successes, trumpeted those successes, there would be more people who realize that there is a way to scale up that idea that they have that does some good in their neighborhood or you know, whatever they're doing, that you can scale it. And, and, and there, there, there are beginning to be, I think, so, uh, networks to sort of help people mentor others to do that. SIG at Mars it was, was designed to do that. And, I don't know a lot about it. I know they do really good stuff there. And I, and, I, and I began to appreciate how many really smart people want to become a social entrepreneur because they're just not interested in, in, in getting on the treadmill, right? And Amy. One, one of the factors that I, I find in government, we haven't yet put a proper definition of what are the benefits of social entrepreneurism. Tom talked about, you know, in terms of Mars, and how do we measure success? We measure success too quickly about job creation uh, and how much money am I leveraging uh, and you know what's that economic value that I bring to the table. The social side of it doesn't have that clean definition to it. And so we need to develop what that definition is and, and have governments adopt it, accept it, and then you'll see more investment into it. There was actually a really, on that note, there's a really neat model like social bonds, right? Where then this, in England they're doing this now, where a group says, look, I actually know how to reduce juvenile diabetes through after school programs, or something like that. And they say to the government, if I can do that, I will save you money in health care, or I will save you money in lower crime rates because I'm running after school basketball programs or something. But I, I, I define the outcome, the social benefit of my project, 
and I put a value on that to the government. Lower crime rates, lower health care costs, you know, better use of education. The metric is difficult and you've got to figure it out. But then you raise a bond and you, and you have the government say, I'm going to pay you to get this result. I'm going to pay you half what it would have cost me to get that result. And then you go out and raise the money from the markets uh, called a social bond. So there's, there's, neat, there's neat models out there to bring the metric of the social good together with the economic benefit of the social good. I know we always end up talking about economic benefit and the whole sure. world is run by economists. And, you know, it gets a bit you know, tiring, and, but that's how the world works. And you can, you can essentially scale it up with those kinds of financial mechanisms. The, the other short-term um, problem, governments exist for five years <laughs> or less. And so they need their payback in that period of time because they gotta get, they've got to get elected again. Those kinds of social outcomes are longer in nature. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I've, I've been in this business far too long, perhaps. I've, I've served under all three governments provincially, NDP, Conservative, Liberal. And, and at the core of them, they're all the same. You know, peel away some of the, the their, 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 you know, a few of the fundamental differences. But they all look, no sooner do they get elected, it's, okay, what do I got to do to get myself reelected? And so you bring out this kind of concept about social entrepreneurs uh, and the payback, you know, in terms of reducing health care. Yeah. And study upon study upon study, just on the health side, say these kinds of investments will reduce the deficit. We're paying over 50 cents of every dollar raised in this province to health care, and it's going up. Yeah. And yet governments go, yeah, geez, we've got to get our head around it. But, oh, no, sorry, that's too long term. Because the benefit may come when I'm no longer the government. Yeah, right. Somebody else is going to take the credit. Alex, did you have any, uh, any thoughts on the social, <coughs> social entrepreneurship, social innovation? So I guess to, to a certain degree, I didn't know a lot about uh, the, the term and how it fit and all that sort of stuff as well. But you know, to a certain degree, with any of the um, systems and systems design work, so we went through a fair bit of... Um, um, and we actually had a group from England that was helping us with, with taking a look at systems and systems design work within our operations and within our operating minds. And, and they basically established three cornerstones established with the development of any good system. So there's a technology, okay, there's the social or the people component of it, and there's the commercialization or the commercial benefit ultimately. That to a certain degree, if you don't have a good balance between those three, you know, your system isn't properly designed or won't work efficiently. And, and so definitely, you know, the, the social and the people interaction with any system, either new technology or anything, is extremely important. Right. And, and the one interesting thing from, uh, that, that is really uh, kind of astounding is the, the Mowat Center, which is one of Canada's leading think tanks, had a prediction for the role of social innovation citing the, the days of depending on government grants and philanthropic contributions to get the for-profit or non-profit social enterprises that have a material impact to social uh, you know, challenges or complex issues that we have, the, 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 the growth opportunity in those funding sources is almost peaked in Canada, citing the only way that we can really make it work is developing sustainable revenue models that have a double or triple bottom line impact. And the interesting concept around social bonds applied to municipalities, potentially some of the complex societal issues that we have in the greater Sudbury area, we could do a transposed municipal bond to solve that issue to generate a meaningful return using just traditional capital forces. So it's a, it's a trend that they foresee in Canada taking over quite dramatically over the next five to ten years. Quite familiar with the impact bonds and the impact Absolutely. investing that the Center for Social Innovation actually used to leverage. Uh, yes. to purchase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally got that and brought six entrepreneurs from Sudbury down to Mars to listen to the Impact Investment Forum with the Rockefeller Foundation. Now it's funny that we have to import or export our kids out, our young people. These are young, you know, 25 young thinkers and great ideas. Um, mind you, Mars did acknowledge Sudbury was in the house, which was quite nice. <laughs> but, you know, there was a great education there to be learned around impact investing and the triple bottom line. But when you bring those concepts back home, and there's energy around that, um, it, people glaze over, they, they don't get the triple bottom line, they don't get the sustainability, the, you know, the, the models that are being tested and proven out there. Um, so you're, you're kind of loaning it a little bit here. Yeah. I feel a bit of a, like a loner, <laughs> uh, bringing these concepts back home. We'll work and, with you on and, that. and getting the strategic support from yeah. our community to, to embrace. 
we have a brand new organization in town which is less than two years old, youthinnovation.ca, um, that has tons of potential. And um, so it's just, it's just a cultural shift and I'm anxious for that to take place right. soon. Any other questions? Uh, right here, uh, Dick has a question. No, no, oh, no, you're next. You had a question, Dick, sorry? Yes. Yeah, use the microphone here. Hi, um, I'm a disciple of, of Porter's work on clusters. And um, in the past 10 years, we've been running an organization called the Sudbury Area Mining Supply and Service Association. And we now have 100 corporations. And we have 30 associate corporations. And I've watched during the past 10 years, in my learning experience, that innovation occurs most dramatically within incremental steps in people who solve problems for their clients. Very few dramatic, and I'm not sure if that's the right word, but disruptive, that's the word I learned. I'm learning all the time, but <laughs> I, I, the dis disruptive technologies in innovation are few and far between. And it seems to me that, when I listened to your talk today, I mean, the passion you have, it's the same kind of passion I have about my, our industry, because I think we sell intelligence worldwide, and I'm trying to find uh, the right avenue. Shreds work, uh, but I don't find that companies respond to shreds only, that there needs to be another stimulus, it has to be an internal desire to do that. But what I've, what I've seen in the past 10 years, it, it, my God, 10 years, my former chairman sitting next to me, and I just, <laughs> uh, the last 10 years is that I went out last week and visited four companies that are members. And each of them are making changes because the market is demanding they make changes, not because NORCAD asked them to do it, or FedNOR is going to give them the money, or, or Valley is going to take an experiment with them and try it all the time. Can you all comment about the whole concept of cluster models and how they can be grown, how, how in fact we can get this incremental step escalated? Because I, it's absolutely critical that we do that in Sudbury, because I think we're the mining capital for in, intelligence in the world, and I'm going to keep preaching it till I die which may be soon, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so who would like to start with that one? Sure, I'll go first. Yeah, Alex? <laughs> so I've been involved with the, the formation of SEMI, and I'm now on the, uh, um, the Canadian Mining Innovation Council. Uh, so, you know, uh, working in councils and, and various um, uh, broad-based groups. I guess in, in there are, there are it, a lot depends on the, the type of change that you are trying to make, though, to a certain degree. I mean, um, in some cases, if you feel that it's going to give you a strategic advantage over your competitors, you, you may not necessarily want to have a, a, a cluster or, or a large group of people uh, helping you solve this problem. Um, but, you know, just recently we went through a situation of, of trying to distill uh, some very fundamental issues associated with, you know, what's and, and the types of changes that we need to make. And we had an innovation uh, session where we had, you know, uh, a very broad group of, you know, probably 80 people from various areas throughout. And, and the different ideas and, and various components of things that come out, it's just unbelievable in terms of, of the benefit ultimately that that could lead to the industry as a whole. So, you know, definitely, um, and I, and I think as a society as a whole, I think this is, this is where we are beginning to grow into in terms of recognizing the, the majority of the problems you can't solve yourself. Uh, the majority of the problems when you put to a collective group, you come up with much better solutions for sure. Right. Tom. Uh, I would, I would, I, clusters are often local, right? And cl people meet, know each other and hang out in the same industry. And I mean, that's the Mars model. Like we think place matters. That's why we have a, a building in which this, a lot of this activity takes place. Um, but I think things that are quite specialized, I think clusters can be virtual as well, right? So the idea, you know, I've heard twice now that Sudbury is by itself, and therefore there isn't a kind of momentum here. And I, I don't, I don't, I'm not from Sudbury, so I, I don't know if what I'm saying is true or not. But um, mining companies are global, right? Uh, all. all in businesses are trying to solve similar kinds of problems. They're trying to lower energy use, or they're trying to get more efficient at what they do, and so on. And so the, the challenge is, you know, it's like someone's in you know, a teleconferencing came, Cisco teleconferencing, we don't have to travel anymore. 
That's not true because all the real data happens in the bar after the meeting, right? This is, the, this is why you know, conferences still matter. So place matters, con physical contact matters, people matter. But at the same time, I think, I don't know that Sudbury's by itself, right? We do live in a world in which information is shared. Markets are all global. Anybody doing anything in Sudbury that's only for Sudbury customers doesn't make sense because presumably you're solving a problem here. The same problem exists somewhere else, right? So I think there are these links that can be made, right? And that's the way to begin to think about building a business in Sudbury. You know, you may have a first customer here because you know them, but you surely must be going to global markets as well. And so that, that's the link, right? And there are places like NORCAT and Mars who are mandated to try to help those things happen. But at the end of the day, I do think it's a pragmatic, problem-driven approach. I think you're right. I think inno innovations solve problems that exist that very rarely come out of the blue. And they, but they're not solving problems in isolation. Problems in Sudbury exist in thousands of other places around the world. And solving a problem here automatically means you're solving a problem that exists somewhere else. Amy, any comments? Yeah, clearly cluster and collaboration is important for us in Northern Ontario. Uh, we, we have small SMEs scattered across Northern Ontario. Give you an example. We have 4,000 small, medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, that currently produce product or service that it's exportable outside of the region, nationally, internationally, globally. 4,000. And so we do, we, you know, we do the analysis and we say, you know, that's good, great, you know what, we're out there. How many are actually doing it? Less than 600. Less than 600 companies out of these 4,000 who could be doing global work, product, service, are doing it. And so, you know, then we ask questions. What the hell is going on? You know, I don't need to be chasing a Toyota plant in the world or, or some newfound uh, organization, business. I just need to start working my own. Now, there's a certain number of companies that go, you know what, thank you very much. Quality life is important to me. Saturday and Sunday, go to the camp, whatever, and, you know, I'm very happy. But there are uh, too many others that say a couple things. One, I'm too small. I don't know where the hell to start. How do I get into, uh, you know, a, a China market or an India market or even, even into the U.S.? And so scale is everything. Uh, and, and then you have others that are saying, I'm sitting in Atacocan, you know, and I'm, I'm producing product or service A. How the hell do I get it from here to over there? And I don't know. The other thing is we lack this collaborative capacity. When I started with FedNor, first thing I did is I went and I talked to all of my other developed agency colleagues across Canada. I said, like, how do you guys work in terms of getting your, your, your sectoral industries together, uh, you know, and, and creating, uh, you know, schmooze and, and, and uh, ability to want to work together? No problem. So, you know, talking to, to the guys at Western Diversification, who want the petroleum, uh, you know, guys to get together? Call the petroleum industry or the association. The association calls all the members. We sit around the table. Boom. I bring it back to Northern Ontario. Tell me what association we have that represents our constituency as a whole. We've got SAMHSA. You guys do a great job. You, you don't represent that many members outside of the region of Sudbury. Yet we've got a huge mining activity in Timmins and going through the same issues and opportunities as your business uh, opportunities or your, your business firms are. The same thing up in northwestern Ontario where there's $135 billion dollars worth of mining activity proposed in the next 10 years and they're going to go through all the same pain and, and yet they've got no capacity uh, you know, to talk to each other. And so we don't do a good job in terms of collaborating with each other, forming organizational capacity and we need to do a better job. And the same thing applies in the forest industry. You know, and we, we, we all know the, the downturn that has happened in Northern Ontario in, in terms of the forestry industry. Yet we don't have, we don't have an association that speaks to all of the members in that industry, you know, and never mind cutting down trees for two by fours, but talking about, you know, taking that cellulose and making it into a different product and having that first plant that you were talking about earlier somewhere in Northern Ontario, sitting on piles and historic piles of sawdust that could be used for those purposes to generate that, that, new, uh, that new activity. So we're trying to build that, and so, but you've got to bring willingness. Willing partners and people got to come to the table. Government can't do it by itself. So we've heard a lot of a lot of ideas as to you know here are the core challenges that many of these entrepreneurs, innovators, larger small companies face. And what's interesting is in June of this year, uh, Minister Flaherty and the federal government announced 
uh, earmarking $400 million to inspire and drive and motivate entrepreneurial endeavors and innovative companies to really help them get through this valley of death. If I throw you on the firing line and say, hey, if I was to give you $400 million and you were to do something with that money, what would you do to really drive economic and social prosperity or job and wealth creation? And we'll start with Alex. What would you do with the $400 million if you were advising the government right now? <laughs> so, so if I went back to the, uh, the point that I had before in terms of saying to a certain degree innovation, there's three components to innovation. One is you have to solve a problem, okay, and you need an idea to solve that problem. And the third component is the commercialization of that, you know, ultimately to a point where, you know, it's creating wealth. Um, and, and, you know, so how is it that we can get our good idea people together with our good entrepreneurs in such a way that it will uh, assure that, you know, the, the commercialization ultimately takes place in, in regards to the solving our problems and, right. and improving, you know, the wealth of the, um, and, and I agree completely. I mean, you know, the problems that we have in the mining industry in Sudbury are not unique to Sudbury, you know that the problems that, that are being solved uh, have markets, uh, markets around the world for sure. Right. Okay. So somehow, you know, that money needs to pull that together. Enabling organizations, you know. connectors, right. 400 million to SAMHSA. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Tom, what would you do? What would you advise the federal government to do with the 400 million? Uh, I'd give me 30 of it to double the size of my fund. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I would, uh, because uh, we're the most active clean tech fund in North America. Uh, I, we'll, we'll, we've done seven deals done by the end of this year. We'll have our entire fund placed within, within 24 months of starting. So I would, I would uh, look to the venture community and say, which are the most active funds? Because a lot of these funds make money sitting on their fees. So I would, I would, the most active funds, I would give them more money to play with. But the money would come with the condition that you get no fees from that money. Because venture funds typically make you know, 2% off the top to cover their overhead. And they have carry, which is you're motivated to make money because you get a piece of the profit. Take the fees off the table so you make no money on fees. Uh, but the most active funds get doubled up in size. Amy, what would you do? Two things. One, get it out of the hands of government. <laughs> give, it to <laughs> give it to venture capitalists. Yes. <laughs> They're the folks that, that know business and know how to drive business. Secondly, I think the program should at least allow for minimum 20% loan loss. And you should not be held you know, to, uh, you know, and, and thrown on the, on the flames uh, for losing money. Because that's the big problem we have. Everybody has got to account for every dollar that we invest. When I was with the MHFC, I had a 20% loan loss provision annually. And I used, to, I used to curse myself if I couldn't come close to it. If I did better than that, you know, my board would go, yeah, that's really good, 7%, you're really doing good. And I'm saying, no, I'm not. I'm investing in the wrong kinds of things if I'm, I'm making all this money. We have to take risks. We have to be willing to take a loss. Bingo. <laughs> yeah. um, any questions? We're uh, just about closing down here. If you've been eager to ask one, I encourage you to do it now. If you could stand up and introduce yourself. I'm uh, Janet Gasparini. I'm the uh, director of the Social Planning Council here in Sudbury. And just to change um, venues a little bit uh, to Tom, and, and if others want to add their thoughts, I, I was very intrigued with the pictures of the hotel and the, uh, you know, the energy piece. And I've just come off about a year of sitting on a, um, an implementation team for the Northern Growth Strategy, which is sitting somewhere in government's hands. And, I'm sure we'll never see the light of day with the changes that are coming. But anyway, I spent a year there and listened to people from all over Northern Ontario. And so one of our big issues in Northern Ontario was energy, the cost of energy, the availability of energy, and really is in the way of, of us moving forward. And another very wicked problem that I think we, we work with in the North is, is housing, and particularly in the far, nor far North on Aboriginal communities. And so I'm just wondering, uh, Tom, from your, you know, from your perspective, uh, what are the innovative solutions for us in the North that we might start to think about and work on those areas and clearly if others have suggestions I'd love to hear them. Well three come to mind right away. I mean the first one is you know all buildings use energy and buildings account for most of our energy use in, in cities and, and all of the stuff I did on my hotel would apply to any, any building in the north. Um, geothermal being the big one right so solar might not work as well in winter because of daylight hours but uh, geothermal is the lion's share of it and it works anywhere. The trick is 
um, to find the patient capital. I mean, so it, these things provide a payback of about seven years. Um, so you just, I mean, and most companies don't do seven year payback stuff. They want 12 to 18 months, that's my operating budget, that's it. My capital budget is a different thing, and if it's not in my core business, I won't put my capital budget toward that. So I think CFOs need to understand that the cost of energy on, as a line item on their income statement is core to their business, and they, they can make long-term investments to reduce that line item as a hedge against future energy cost increases. So that's really just a CFO who owns the building uh, to say, I'm going to tap my, my capital budget for something that has a seven-year payback. That isn't, if I'm a t-shirt factory, isn't making t-shirts. It's, it's reducing my costs. The second is biomass. I mean, I, I do think, I mean, if the, the right, the second generation cellulosic ethanol hydrocarbons are coming into the market now. There's been big mistakes, range fuels and so on. The market's learned from those mistakes and there are really promising gen, I call them gen 2.5 biofuels coming on the market. They need fiber supply. Right? There, this is a breadbasket of fiber supply. And I think build, and we're going to talk, we're, part of what we're talking about this week is building those relationships and making sure that, that we have those companies looking at the north to set up their commercial plants. Because they're not going to, the innovation's down in Toronto, but we're not going to build a plant in Toronto. <laughs> like, that's not, it's going to be built up here, right? If it, you know. And then the third is um, there are now energy storage um, uh, technologies coming into the market, underwater compressed air, ultra low spinning flywheels so that those northern communities can get off diesel and you can make uh, renewables dispatchable. So down in Aruba, uh, they have a 30 megawatt wind farm that we are putting hydro store, underwater compressed air energy storage on. They're going to add another 30 megawatts. They're going to take the island off diesel. Uh, you don't need a lot of storage, you know, uh, but we're going to have that wind as dispatchable power, baseload dispatchable power. You can do that in the north as well. So th these things are coming. Um, yeah. And housing? Uh, the housing is, is I, I don't know, I don't have a big answer for that. A lot of insulation in the roof or something. I mean, I mean <laughs> there's nothing high tech there. <laughs> okay. You know, Alex, if I could maybe direct the question to you, and knowing that Valet is a huge energy user, you know, what is your outlook in terms of how do we reduce this cost item? What, what, what is the strategy that you're thinking as a large corporate where I'm assuming 20 to 25% of your operating costs are probably electrical, uh, electricity? What do you see, knowing that energy rates are continuing to go up? Does Valet have a, a strategy or an approach to say, in order for us to maintain our global competitiveness of this operation, what is the, can you share any thoughts as to what you're thinking on that? So Valet, as a, as a larger corporation, definitely has a lot of energy, um, and, and to a certain degree, the diversity in terms of getting into um, uh, um, producing or mining uh, the uh, potash and, and the various other um, products that ultimately will help um, uh, fertilizers and various other products that will help uh, to grow things is, is part of that strategy in regards to energy um, and energy producing components. Uh, they have started into the biodiesel uh, 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 or producing and using biodiesel a lot more. Um, I guess you know a little closer uh, we do have an energy group that is looking at, you know, within the mines and within our operations where the major energy consumers are, consumable areas are, and what we can do to further reduce that. Um, we've uh, supported a project at uh, SEMI and on um, uh, ventilation on demand. Uh, so ventilation is right. a high cost consumer in, in our mines and going to a ventilation on demand system will reduce that substantially. Uh, the rail there, as I mentioned earlier, is an uh, electric-driven uh, piece of equipment rather than diesel. Uh, with some of the mines that we're looking at, it would require one-third the ventilation that we currently use in our mines. So, you know, definitely we're looking at a lot of the various components of that sort of thing, um, and, and thus, you know, the lean green mining machine that we want to become. Right. Amy, from your perspective? Yeah, uh, you know, clearly we, 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 need, a, we need a policy uh, with respect to energy in, uh, in the province of Ontario, if not even in just northern Ontario. Janet, you talked about the growth plan, and, and hopefully, knock on wood, something comes out of that. We produce more power, just existing power sources, now in northern Ontario, than we utilize. We ship it down southern Ontario, then it comes back to us when we need it, uh, and we have to pay a premium for it. And yet, you know, alternative energy sources... I heard a minister of the province recently talk about uh, in, I, th I think it was just Northern Ontario, we, we have 73 billion trees. We cut less than half of 1% of 
of those trees annually. So you want to talk about stock being available for other purposes? We have in the forestry industry, generally speaking, I think they, 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 they talk about it in, ter in terms of 40, 35 to 45 million cubic meters of wood fiber available right. that could be taken out of, of the forest each year uh, and be replenished without a problem. We are currently taking less than one third of that activity. And again, for traditional purposes, pulp and wood yep. and paper. And paper is all, all the time. Nobody's talked about, let's look at this resource from a different perspective. Yeah. Let's make it an energy resource. Yeah, no, very insightful. And that's actually probably going to be my key takeaway from today in terms of opportunity. Uh, any uh, last questions? I don't know if the panelists will be available for much in the duration afterwards. So again, if you are keen to ask one, I would suggest doing it now. OK, uh, well, on behalf of the group here, unless anyone has any closing remarks or maybe uh, Anything that you might want to add in terms of, you know, given the theme of innovation for a greater Sudbury, is there any closing remarks or any thoughts uh, that you'd like to share with the broader group? You're We're good. Enough for me. Okay, <laughs> no more questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>